Hey, what is going on, everyone? Alex Shlinsky here for Prospecting On Demand. We are back for another Anti-Hustler Weekly show. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Mr. Brian Downard. Today, we're going to be talking about how to become an authority in your industry and how short-form content is your key to the kingdom. That's what we're going to be talking about with a very special guest, Connor Snyder of Story. If you have no idea what Story is, prepare yourself for a company that has two Ys in its name, but more importantly, is going to help you make a whole bunch of money and impact. Connor Snyder, how are you today, buddy? Dude, I'm doing so great. So excited to be here. So right before we started the show, you said you're getting married this week, but you're more excited about the show than the marriage. That's kind of weird. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. that's not what I said. It was it's recorded. Not- it was recorded, <laughs> buddy. It was there. I didn't, I didn't, um, hear, I didn't hear him say it either. Alex. Brian, you're supposed to be on my side. Gosh. Come on, man. Connor is also yeah. a client. The client is always right. So. <laughs> That's fair. Facts. Hashtag facts. Okay. Fair, fair. I'm lying. Everything I said was not true. Other than the money thing and the two whys and the story thing and all that. Um, let me do a quick infomercial bluntly as we get started today. You guys need to be using Story. Um, it's an incredible application uh, and tool and service um, that we've been working with for about seven months now. Um, basically, all the reels that you guys see that I do on every platform, so Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube Shorts, um, I'm not sure where else. I'm sure I'm doing it other places. All of them are curated directly by Story in their app. Um, the coolest part about the the product for me with Story is the previous way that I was doing um, my short form content, Connor, was I'm trying to find the word here, but infuriating is the only thing that I could come up with. I have to make content, then I have to airdrop it to my computer, then I have to put it on Google Drive, and then explain to my editor what I want. It just was a mess. The app allows you to do all that in on your phone directly. Anyone that makes content that has an editing team, it's impossible to compete with what Story provides. It's just not possible. If you already have a team doing it for you, I would strongly recommend at the very least going with their lowest price product just to show off what you can do with it. I'm almost positive that you will replace the team that you currently have with Story. I had to start with the infomercial because it's true. Yes, I'm biased, of course, because they are clients. But the truth is, and I've told this to Connor, and I'll say it again, like whether or not story was ever a client of pod this product is by far the best i've ever seen in terms of short form content for those of you in the agency space or coaching space that is trying to create an opportunity for yourself to stay relevant top of mind consistently you need to be doing content on a daily basis and video content is how people are engaging more than ever before on pretty much every single platform and there's no way that there's a better way to do it than with story i truly sincerely believe that uh, so i just want to showcase some appreciation to you first connor and to the entire team devin and allison and austin and everyone else um you guys are great and i just want to say thank you first appreciate that man glad it's been a good experience for you yeah it's been awesome um i will share a quick anecdote that i don't think i told this to brian but i thought it was hilarious uh you and i were doing a call like a month and a half or two months ago um and i was coaching the, the csm from from uh, story and i was giving her some insights on how to be a better client success manager and like things for the team to do and um you know i was talking to connor about a month after that conversation and explaining like you know, I don't know if if I'm counted as like a VIP client or whatever, because like my experience is really good, but I don't know if they're like doing it extra special because like you guys are clients of mine and you're trying to like impress me. And Connor's like, oh, no, 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 you're not a VIP. <laughs> so funny, but he didn't mean it that way. He meant it more like, no, like this is how we're doing it now for everyone. But it was hilarious how he said it. I thought that was great. <laughs> I loved it. I thought it was so good, Connor. Um, so a couple of people are asking where to go um, for Story. So why don't you tell them, uh, Connor, a little bit about Story, how it started, and then where they can go to get started with it and give it a shot. Yeah. So I uh, was working at a mortgage company, and we were building an internal marketing agency inside the mortgage company. And if you're not familiar with the mortgage space, uh, it's a lot of loan officers who are working their personal networks, sphere of influence to build business, right? It's all about personal relationships. And so when we were at the mortgage company, the marketing team was trying to run ads for the mortgage company. You know, that's the corporate mor- mortgage company's name and you're running it to people that might be looking at a home. And the reality was, is no one cared, right? Um, because when you're going to start to shop for a home, you're not wondering what mortgage company should I go work with? So we came up with this idea of let's go get our actual loan officers who have their relationships. Let's get them to create short form videos and let's turn that into organic and paid content that we can use to bring them business. So we started running the strategy there and it 
kicked ass. <laughs> like everyone was getting more leads. They were getting more DMs. They were getting more conversations and they were getting more business. And so the lesson that I took away from that was the importance of personal brand and the importance of your personal content in front of your audience, right? It's, it's that personal relationship that we're trying to develop in short form on social, where your network is, where your social graph is, is a killer way to do it. And so that was kind of the beginning of story. And, you know, at first we were really focused on how do we generate leads for customers? But this, we saw that this short form content thing was a prerequisite to getting your ads to work. 100%. And so we just started focusing on this and yeah. it's been impressive. It's absolutely amazing what um, story can do because I think it's really relevant to understand why we're doing this show today, right? The, the, the title of the show is how to become an authority in your industry, right? And so I don't want to be like sanctimonious or anything to say that I'm an authority in our industry, but the reality is, right, we have on, on a weekly basis... 10 to 25 people on this show. Uh, you know, we have events three to four times a year with 70 to 100 people. We are, you know, have a Facebook group of 7,500 people. You have spoken at the high level events. They sponsor our events. Like we're doing something right, right? I'm, I'm, again, I'm not going to try to tune our own horn, but we're doing something right, okay? The reality is though, staying up to date is really, really hard. It's really challenging. And the thing is, Connor, I get asked all the time by clients in POD of like, is it valuable to like start a podcast? And is it valuable to like do a bunch of content? And is it valuable to post? And the answer, of course, is yes. But it's like a, a very hard ROI game, right? It's a very hard ROI game because it, it takes a long time. And there's so much of it that don't it doesn't have actually any like direct impact or attribution. And so I'll give you an example. And I would love to know kind of what your thoughts are on this, Connor, as well. But I get this message probably I would say like twice a week or so. Hey, Alex, I saw your reel or video on so-and-so topic um, and I had a question about it. And then they want to book a call and either become a client um, or they already are a client. I go back to that reel, Connor, and there's no like from them. There's no engagement from them, right? And so you think because of how you know the human brain works, like Pavlov conditioning, right? You're like, well, if no one's engaging and no one's commenting, well, then it means it's shit and it's not worth the time. But what you're not getting is that the reality is kind of what I believe. I'm, I'm making this number up for clarity, but like, I don't know, 75 to 80 percent of people that engage with content don't actually do physical engagement. They're just, they're just taking it. They're just like listening to it, right? It's why you see all the time on YouTube videos, like the amount of views versus the amount of likes versus comments, the views are are 10 times the size of the comments or likes because people are just taking the content, not engaging with it. This is what I used to call the halo effect or the invisible effect of content. And I used to get annoyed about it, but now it's just like, I have to just keep up with it, even if I'm not getting the direct engagement because I know it's still making an impact. I just can't track it. How do you kind of like deal with that dissonance, Connor, of wanting to be a company proving that you can create engagement, but still expressing like how important it is to stay top of mind and relevant, even if it's only through an invisible effect, like them seeing it, but not necessarily engaging? Yeah. Okay. So there's a couple of things to unpack here. One of the things I like to kind of compare this to is like buying a house. So think about attention as equity, attention equity, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of us here are marketers. So we understand the idea of performance marketing and paying to drive traffic for leads on Facebook and Instagram. Like we're familiar with that, right? You are renting attention by paying Facebook, paying Meta, paying any ad platform to get your content in front of them. You can have a response from the people that are interested and then drive paid traffic, right? That's rented attention. And part of this strategy is you're investing in building audience or attention equity over time. And so when we talk about the ROI of this, like you can buy a house and not see that increase your wealth for years and years, right? When we're building an audience online, we have to understand that we're investing in that relationship and it's a, a attention equity that we're trying to build. So we can always go and rent our attention from our audiences right out of the gate. And sometimes that's the thing that we need as a business. We might not be in a position to go and buy a house or invest in that relationship with our audience. But over time, you do not want to have to be beholden to having to pay for attention every time you need it. So you've got to invest in building that attention equity. So when you're thinking about the ROI of this, this is not a short play. What you're trying to do is build a meaningful relationship with your audience. And when you talk about views, 
I mean, it's so funny because if I asked you, hey, do you remember the person that started the cinnamon challenge? You're going to say no. But we all know the videos of people shoving spoons of cinnamon in their mouth and choking, right? Virality is not an indicator of success, right? You can have videos go viral and no one's going to know who you are. A hundred views from the right audience is way more valuable than a hundred thousand views from the wrong audience, right? So if you go, Twitter actually did something interesting. This was probably two or three months ago where they actually showed the view count on tweets and you would go see tweets that had millions of views, but like 50 retweets. And you're like, okay, if I didn't see that view count, I would totally miss, <laughs> yeah, X, right? If I didn't see the view count, I would totally miss how much engagement this actually had. But the reality is, is only 10% of people are making content in the first place. And only a subset of people that are on the platforms are actually engaging with it. Most of us are lurkers. And if you think through your own social media usage, how much content are you seeing, watching, saving, sending, sharing, that you don't ever touch the like or comment button? You're just passively consuming it. And that's the vast majority of people on social media. It's why, Alex, you're telling me you got people reaching out to you to do business and never have engaged with your stuff. And it's because they're like most of us. We don't want to we're not going to, we're going to consume as passively as possible, unless there's something that's really pulling us in. Right. Yeah. If I could just say most of you, you're hurting my feelings, but anyways, great insight, Connor. <laughs> no, it's actually brilliant side note for real Connor straight up. Like I know we're on the show, but Devin needs to watch everything you just said, making sure that he's saying everything you said. That was fire. That was really, really good. Uh, Brian, I'll kick it over to you. Yeah, I got it. Man, for sure. So the, the metaphor you used, um, was really powerful. I love that. Um, and also getting the right views, right? Because I think so many of us get in our feelings if we post something and it doesn't get a lot of engagement because we are basing it off of vanity metrics. And I mean, I mean, but to be really, I, I get in my feels about Alex's content because I'm like, it's good content and we're making a lot of it consistently. But oh man, that one video got like two likes and 80 views, how stupid. But if one of those 80 viewers comes and gives us a pay in full for our program, that's a huge revenue boost for our company that month, right? So and I it love has that. happened, by the way, Brian. That has I can I can I, I directly know. attribute I, that. Like Connor, I talk to you this, way I too much. Trust me, I know. It's true. <laughs> All day, every day. Um, yeah, and so Connor, what I want to kind of build on. You made this comment about kind of cutting your teeth in the mortgage space and uh, the idea that the people in that space, and I really see this, right? Because we, uh, one of our really good friend is our mortgage broker and he stays close because we buy houses and we were trying to build up a um, real estate portfolio here and some rental properties. So he stays close and I can kind of feel that. But what's interesting about real estate different from marketing is uh, anyone can essentially be a customer. Any of your Facebook friends, Instagram friends, I'm a mortgage broker, I'm a real estate agent, they could be a client. A lot of us here on this call, since we sell marketing services to a really specific type of person, whether that's lawyers, dentists, whoever. So What's your take on how can I start creating content for the audience that can actually give me money and not necessarily like my friends and family? Like how do I, and where do I put that, right? Do I just put it onto my profiles that are I've built up as personal pages? Do I start new pages? Like how do I start that process? If I want to commit to this, here's where I can start creating and here's where I should start going with it. No, great question. So I, I think a lot of times, this is a personal decision of how much do you want your personal life and your professional life to be mixed? I would generally say you need to be leading with you as, as the person in front of it. So whether you're going to use your personal account or a business account, I would say you've got to be part of the, the content that's there, right? So I'll see that sometimes, with, especially with like service industry people where they don't want to put their name on content. They want to have their, their um, businesses right. brand on everything. And I would say create an account that's you and then put your business in the description, right? You can yeah. still have content that's going out for your business, but social is about connecting with people. It's about your social graph. And I think that it's important that you lead as a person versus a brand and have the brand be the thing that kind of trails behind you. People yeah. go to social media for a couple of specific things. They go to be entertained. They go to be educated. They go to be expired or it's not expired. They go to be inspired. Uh, um, totally. They go to be validated. And so when you're thinking about the types of content you create, you should be asking yourself, you know, everyone knows what their audience is. Do you know how they want to be educated? Do you know how they want to be entertained? Do you know how they want to be inspired? Do you know how to validate their feelings? That's the kind of content that you should be creating. And you should also be super comfortable experimenting. That everyone, when we talked about this being attention equity, right? When you're 
like unless you just bought a social media account with 100,000 followers, most of us are buying a fixer upper. We're starting from zero on a social media account. And you've got to understand that as you're building this out, before you actually get that attention equity, the payout for building this equity, you're going to have to put in work. You're going to have to do experiments. There's stuff that's going to be going wrong. There's stuff that you're going to be like, ooh, that's nasty. I, I don't like how that turned out. Or I posted this video and I thought it would be great. And then no one cared. You're going to yeah. have to experiment and iterate. And over time, you're going to learn the lessons. And, and that's sure. where you're going to see the growth, right? Okay, cool. I appreciate that. And I guess I don't want this to be like a, a technical question and it it may be even a selfish question, but I think a lot of people here are going to resonate with this. Um, I have different assets in different places. So at one point I went really hard on Instagram and I built up like 2000 followers, but now I don't really post there and the engagement is garbage. I had a YouTube channel. I put a lot of effort into it at one point. It got to like 200 subscribers, but it kind of, now it doesn't, I don't, I don't do anything with it anymore. So like so for the people here who are kind of in that same spot, like I have something sort of, is it worth just starting from zero with a fresh account or trying to kind of breathe life back into something we tried in the past? Great question. So just generally, I, I actually, I, I got on a call with the meta folks to like validate this because this is what all the social media coaches teach, but this is straight from meta themselves. The number one thing that determines how often your content is showed and recommended to other people is consistency. That is the number one thing. And so if you are not being consistent, your content is not going to get seen, which right. means your first couple of videos, you just got to understand it, like it's not going to go viral. It just won't. And so once you put in the reps, you're going to start seeing that content happen more consistently, whether you're starting from an account that had engaged before and doesn't, or something brand new, I think is irrelevant. Personally, I would just like stick with the IG account you've got that's at 2000 and just start getting consistent and you'll start seeing that growth and engagement happening. Cool, Love great, it. thank you. Love it. The, uh, one of the additional thoughts that I, I think is really valuable related to story and developing this kind of brand for yourself, especially when it comes down to like the time that it takes, right? Because again, this takes time to create the results that we're talking about. And virality doesn't mean you consistently get viral, right? It's not like everyone just magically becomes Mr. Beast and every single video has millions of views, right? You can have someone, it's very possible, like on TikTok or Instagram, where you have views of 10,000, 50,000, 75,000, et cetera, right? On one video. And then the next 25 videos are all in the hundreds. It's totally feasible and possible. And it's not that you're necessarily doing anything wrong or bad. It's just kind of part of the game, right? Some people get really concerned, Connor, because they feel this requirement of like the only way to stay viral or to be, um, you know, uh, present in their authority in their industry is by being ultra, ultra aggressive in the communication in which they're kind of sharing very contrarian opinions, because that's the only way they can grab attention, but then they kind of find themselves not actually being who they are. And one of the things I'll tell you is, you know, I've done that before, right? Like uh, when Kanye West said some crazy stuff, um, you know, I, I went on there and I did like a very strong opinion about it. And that was, of course, the most engaged video I've had of the whole year, because it's a common topic is people want to argue with me because they love Kanye or they agree with me because they hate Kanye. And uh, I don't remember the view count, but it was high. It was, you know, a few thousand and like more than 30 comments, which is way more than usual um, in general. But like, when I, when I went back, Connor, and went through it, I was like, eh, you know, I don't really want to be like doing this type of content. I'm not really that interested in it. Also, like I end up wanting to fight people in comments, which is very stupid. So <laughs> I don't really want to deal with it. But one of the things I found that I think is really valuable with story and content and authority building in general is even if you do kind of the, and I think this is a strong way to stay, but like mayonnaise content, like kind of just run of the mill, valuable. It's not flashy or crazy or special is just good editing, good content consistently. Anytime you do a sales conversation, anytime you meet someone, anytime you communicate with someone, anytime you are founded anywhere online, those people are liable to go look you up because it's really easy in today's age to find people and see their content. And if it's accessible content that's in 60 seconds and you've got a, a, you know, a book of content essentially that's like 30, 50, 75 pieces long and they're just scrolling through, their confidence in your product or offer or willingness to jump on a call with you or willingness to pay you is way higher, way higher, even though you're doing the mayonnaise content, right? And, and that's the framework that I think is important. But here's the question, Connor, that I think a lot of people struggle with that I think story has a great solution for, which is, okay, but what if we struggle to come up with the ideas for my content? How do you handle that, Connor? 
Totally. So that's one of the number one reasons why people don't create content is they get paralyzed by like, well, what am I going to say? They think they put the camera in front of them and then all of a sudden they just tense up and their mind goes blank. And so the way that story works is we are combining human and AI creativity to make it easy to create content. And we start with AI generated ideas. You give us a topic that you want to be known for, and then we go and create scripts and suggestions of videos that you can make with a hook outline of talking points and an outro. We have an in-app teleprompter that you can use. You can go record it in the app or throw up your, your nice camera and record it externally. You give us that raw footage, that gets delivered to our fulfillment team. We go and clean up that content, add all the pop-ups, you know, graphics, B-roll, whatever you send over. You know, and, and you know, maybe you've got more than just recording. Maybe you've got a client testimonial. Maybe you've got photos of, of something that happened, right? Give us all the raw content. We'll put it all together in a format that's going to try and maximize the amount of engagement you're going to get from it. But when the, the biggest thing is getting you in front of the camera to record, and we try to just streamline it, streamline it so it's really simple. Nice. Cool. Love it. Um, cool. We're going to just kind of hit you with a bunch of questions that are just top of mind and things we kind of uh, prepared. They're definitely prepared and not made up on the spot. Just kidding. Um, what platform do you recommend starting with? Like, are you saying go Instagram first? Is it YouTube? Should you do both? Did you do like, what, what's your recommendation of like where to put the content? So consistency is the most important thing, right? So I think that if, if you have the means to do it, you should just post everything everywhere. Like you're not going to regret having some sort of presence on the platforms. I think generally though, if you're trying to DIY this or you're trying to do stuff on your own, just pick one right? Like it's going to be too overwhelming for most people to try and go post everywhere. Um, and, and so I would say just pick a platform that you feel comfortable with and that you use consistently. So I think a mistake is if you're really comfortable and consistent on Instagram, you're already a big Instagram user. And then saying, I'm just going to go try and focus all my attention on TikTok. I think you're going to have a harder time making TikTok work for yourself than if you're already an Instagram person. Um, yeah. Now, that being said, Anywhere that's doing short form video is all algorithmic recommendations based off of what they're detecting your interest in. So I think YouTube shorts, Instagram, TikTok are all places where there's a ton of growth opportunity for anybody. Um, but, you know, pick what you're comfortable with if you're DIY. Cool. Love it. Um, yeah. And it's interesting. I've seen YouTube a lot more pushing smaller channels into my feed it's not too often that i'll click on something but you know once in a while it's, if it's interesting enough and the people are trying like i'll i'll click on that but it's sh at least showing me things that are relevant to my interests that maybe aren't someone with a massive following right, right. so i guess you know, a follow-up to this sort of would be you know what do you recommend to do to stand out early on so we obviously hear about this phrase pattern interrupt wanting to have something at the beginning of the video to really hook people in um a really interesting thing i took away from billy one of billy jean's content or pieces of content was props work really well so having something unique different to look at that catches attention unique cool different interesting locations and then anything with a lot of movement and or music so dancing TikTok, if you're goofy enough to do it like is helpful as well so outside of that is there anything you're seeing that's really helpful to inject pattern interrupts to like earn that attention early on without being like alex said maybe controversial or a little bit like slimy or something that doesn't feel true to you yeah so i think that there's all the stuff that that you just recommend from billy jean i think is all useful things um the, th the way that we've actually set up our ai stuff and it's, this is how it's different than ChatGPT, right? I can go to ChatGPT and say, give me a script of a video, right? And that's a great way to do it if, if, you, if that's what you can do. Um, but the way that we're doing it is we actually have, we studied a hundred of our clients and we said, how are people creating engaging content? And we, do, we identified specific patterns of what would be engaging. So it would start with things like interesting facts or um, debatable perspectives. And we kind of built these different um, paradigms um, structures of video content and we actually use that to feed the model so that way when the ai content comes out it's giving you those hooks that have been proven to be attention grabbing so we're doing things that that um like you know debatable perspectives um interesting facts historical insights or stories all that stuff is is things that grabs people attention again it all comes back to how are you educating entertaining validating and inspiring the, the the viewer and if you use your hooks to do those things that are fundamental to how we perceive ourselves as human beings you'll you'll get that engagement that you're looking for nice awesome so. and then just kind of an aside i'll let you go uh, something that i've always picked up is 
see what's working and coming up in your feed, right? Like something that just pops into mind is narrated routines is something that is very popular and that gets fed into people's out al- or the algorithm feeds that into people's news feeds a lot where it's like, hey, here's a day in the life of what I do. And it's narrated clips throughout the day. So kind of just be watching what else is working on the platforms and what you're getting fed in terms of content, what's resonating with you to kind of borrow ideas from these uh, peers of yours. Uh, Alex, take it away, sir. So yeah, I want to show you guys essentially what it looks like on my end with stories. So they have the website, which is great, and also the app itself. And I think it's cool to kind of see because we were just talking about like um, uh, props and stuff. And I think this is the I think this is the best video I've done um, since working together. I, I mean, I had the most fun doing it. But you can see how it works. So I, I upload multiple videos. So I uploaded I think six different videos for them, and I gave them clarity on the description, right? So in the first video, I'm pointing up. It should say in bold text objection. I have to talk to my husband first, which is exactly what they did. And then please make sure you do the videos in the right order. If you have questions, let me know, right? And so then they come back, and this is already completed. I'll play it. I don't know how good it will be on the replay here, but it's only a minute, so it's funny to watch. Also, do some objection handling. So I really like this offer, but I just gotta speak to my husband first. Okay, great. <laughs> I have a question for you. What if your husband says no, though? Then what would you do? I don't see a reason why he would say no, but even if he did, I would make the decision we'd still work together. Absolutely. That completely makes sense. I also have a significant other that I like to run ideas by before I make any sort of investments. Just to confirm, if you were the one making this decision, would you feel comfortable moving forward? Oh, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. We'd be working together. I just want to confirm the pricing with my husband. Perfect. Let's do this. Why don't you put down a $500 refundable deposit so you can go to your husband and tell him that you already made this decision, but you wanted his confirmation before you move forward. That way, if he has any questions, you can ask me, or if he's not comfortable and you end up not wanting to work together, I'll refund you no questions asked, but we'll hold your place in line and get ready to get started this week. Sounds good? Oh my God, I totally love that idea. It totally makes sense. Did anyone ever tell you you're such a good salesperson? Let me go get my credit card. Yeah, and what's cool about that is there's a lot of subtle stuff that if you're not a video editor, you might not recognize that we're doing to try and keep attention engaging, right? So obviously we're editing so that there's yeah. a consistent story going on, but we're also doing things like those zoom ins, right? You, those are the kind of like uh, uh, subtle things that even the viewer isn't necessarily conscious of, but it's giving variety to the video without um, without it being distracting, right? And so what's the subtle stuff that we can do so that it doesn't just feel like it's a raw iPhone video yeah. and it keeps the viewer engaged for as long as possible? Some uh, some inside baseball on that, by the way, guys. I, I think I filmed that video for like 25 minutes for a minute reel because um, I... Yeah, and you had, you had to explain to the landscapers who kept walking. Effed it up, effed it up multiple what times. Are you, what, um, what, what kind of business do you run again? Yeah, uh, effed it up multiple times. But that that's the type of thing that, um, you know, story so, so easily is able to produce by me just giving them six raw videos. And I find that to be really cool. And they've done some really complicated ones too. Like I think I dropped like 14, 15 videos for uh, the POD Live and they made like a great reel out of it. It's just the the services is pretty incredible, honestly. I mean, there's no other way to say it. Um, and I know I'm biased, but at the end of the day, like I feel like I've earned enough trust on this show to be frank with you. Like if it wasn't good enough, we just, we just wouldn't have them on the show. That's the truth. Uh, Connor, I think the easiest and next step is how do people get started with story to even make sure it's the right fit for them? Um, what's the best next step for them? How do they get in touch? What, the, what should they do? Yeah, so you can just go to story.co, S-T-O-R-Y-Y-Y.co, and you can schedule a demo there. Uh, and then we can do a consultation with you on that call and kind of walk you through, you know, what's your kind of content creation status right now? Never done it before. Are you doing it consistently? How can we best supplement what you need? Free up your time so you can really be focused on clients. And, you know, one thing that we do for a lot of agencies is we help them with client content as well. So if you need content for ads, if you need stuff to to help give you creative so that you've got quick turnaround times and have quick iterations on what clients need, um, you can use it for for those kind of things as well. So, yeah, story.co. And, yeah, we'd love to talk with you and see how we can help. All right, y'all, we're going to wrap the recorded show. We'll stay on for a Q&A. Everyone else, thank you so much for checking this out, and we'll see you on the next one.